Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison, and I want to welcome you to day 162 of Humanity Rising. Humanity Rising is an initiative of Ubiquity University and uh, 315 partnering organizations from all over the world uh, who have come together in the midst of this extraordinary pandemic uh, that has put us all into some form of lockdown and generated the new social uh, meme of uh, social distancing uh, and challenged our public health and well being. Uh, in a way not seen for a very long time. We've come together to provide essentially an open space so that people from all over the world uh, can come together uh, and in addition to sharing their experiences to articulate solutions that they're working on that can be scaled globally and perhaps most fundamentally confer together as to how we can enhance our strategic effectiveness to ensure that the world beyond the pandemic is more healthy, more abundant, more regenerative, uh, and in alignment with natural systems uh, and constraints. Each day as we begin our sessions, we take a moment uh, to just pause and breathe deeply, place your attention on your heart, close your eyes, and for about a minute, listen to your heartbeat in a spirit of gratitude and appreciation that you're alive at this extraordinary moment in human history. Thank you, everyone. Now with an open heart and a heart filled with gratitude for all of you who have joined us today, I want to frame our program, which is now entering its fourth day on regenerative cities, cities rising in a regenerative way uh, to embrace the future. Yesterday, I touched on the one city that had the attention of the entire world, and that was Washington, DC. And as we convened our Humanity Rising session, the House of Representatives was debating the second impeachment of Donald Trump. And as probably you all heard on the news, uh, that debate uh, culminated uh, in a vote uh, to impeach uh, the president uh, for the second time. During our session, uh, Marilyn 
Hamilton, one of the conveners, uh, mentioned that cities uh, are the oldest human organisms. So I thought today it would be of interest to everyone to contemplate the oldest known city in the world. And that is the city of Jericho. Jericho is found along the uh, northern um, reaches of the Jordan River uh, in what is now Palestine and Israel. And it dates over 11,000 years old. Jericho is so old that it predates the Neolithic Revolution. It predates agriculture. It goes all the way back to what they call the Natufian culture, between nine and 10,000 years BC. It uh, started out as a little hamlet and archeologists have uh, uncovered over 20 different layers of the city as it has evolved over 11, 12,000 years. Uh, the, the first uh, little homes that they built uh, were circular. Uh, they were made out of uh, straw and clay. Uh, Jericho was situated near a spring. Uh, and in that uh, early Natufian culture, uh, they found evidence that uh, the people uh, hunted uh, for game. Uh, there was also uh, gatherers um, that uh, looked for seeds and, and plants. Um, uh, this is one of the first places uh, where they took those initial steps of uh, honoring the dead. Uh, and in those days, uh, they didn't bury the dead uh, in cemeteries away uh, from uh, the houses or the cities. They buried the dead underneath their own houses, um, uh, their own homes, uh, so that there could be a connection with the ancestors. Uh, fire was used, uh, and um, the uh, early hamlet grew over time. And uh, you may remember uh, in uh, the Bible, if you've read the Old Testament, that Jericho became one of the mighty cities of the um, uh, early Bronze and Middle Bronze Ages. And when the people of uh, Israel uh, came out of Egypt uh, around 1200 BC, and they uh, went in to conquer uh, the um, uh, Palestinian people for the first time, uh, they encountered Jericho. And it was a walled city. Uh, and you may just remember that they uh, sent in uh, a couple of spies, um, and they went into the uh, home of uh, a harlot uh, named Rahab and um, uh, cavorted with her. And then when the uh, magistrates of the city uh, were looking for them, she hid them and let them down out of her window by a rope, and they got away. Uh, but they promised her that when uh, Joshua and the Israelite forces would come back, that they would save her life, uh, which in fact uh, they did. Uh, you may remember uh, Jericho from the stories of uh, Jesus. Uh, it was in Jericho that he healed the blind man. And uh, that was a story that was recorded in, in the various uh, gospels. You may remember that he, he took his spit and some clay and put his, the, the, the moist clay with his own spit on the eyes of the blind man. And the blind man uh, began to see. Uh, then uh, Jericho was involved in the revolt against the Romans. Uh, it was destroyed by the Romans. Um, and then it uh, continued in different manifestations uh, all the way to the present day. It is now a city of about 20,000 people and is part of the Palestinian uh, authority there on the West Bank. 
um, and uh, it has stood um, over now uh, 11 millennia uh, as one of the oldest human organisms uh, in history. Damascus in Syria, also part of that fertile crescent where the original initial civilization emerged of Sumer um, uh, is also uh, an extremely uh, old city. Uh, Tehran in Iran is uh, another very, very uh, ancient city. Uh, Beijing is the uh, one of the oldest cities in Asia. It uh, goes back around 6,000 uh, years um, and uh, uh, was uh, the capital city uh, from uh, its earliest inception. Uh, some cities, uh, because of their location, um, like Jerusalem, uh, were identified as fulcrums of, of not only spiritual power, but political power, economic power, cultural power. And that, of course, is the reason why cities are so important, not only because um, uh, most human beings uh, today live in cities, but because cities are that place where there is the densest concentration of all those civilizational aspects that constitutes humanity um, uh, in its um, cultural form. Uh, so with that uh, little bit of a background, I would like to turn the uh, program over to uh, Beth Sanders. Uh, who's co-convening with Marilyn uh, this uh, five-day program on humanity rising as we start 2021 in the spirit of cities rising. Uh, Beth is the author of a book called uh, uh, Nest Cities, uh, how citizens can uh, serve cities and how cities can serve citizens. And she's the president of Populous Planning, uh, a consulting firm that enables city planners to do a, a better job in formulating the future of cities uh, today. So Beth, thank you and welcome. Thank you very much, Jim, for the, the lovely opening. Um, and I'll introduce my co-host Marilyn Hamilton shortly. Um, what I'd like to do is just pause and reflect on the fact that all human settlement begins with our work. It begins with finding a location where there's water, where there's food, where there are materials to make shelter. And then on top of that, we, we incorporate some kind of resource, something to trade, something to interact with other humans. And this very work that we do over millennia is, is the force that regenerates our cities even today. So all of, the, all of the ways our work that we can see in our lifetimes has differentiated is how we serve each other in a mutual relationship in our cities. I always used to, I always love to use the example of, I don't do my own dentistry. I rely on someone else to do that work on my behalf. There was a time when we did do our own dentistry and in some parts of the world, depending on the circumstances that we're in, we have different ways of relying on each other's specializations in their work to, to be who we are and have what we have in our cities. So thank you for that, that intro, Jim. It's um, very apropos. I'm going to share my screen to give us a sense of where, where we've been this week and, and where we're going. So you know the plot for the week, what the theme is for the week. Um, and some folks have been here all week. There's some folks brand new to today. Um, for Marilyn and I, our objective is to give you an experience this week that allows you to contemplate your city, your community, and if you're in a small place, always we're connected to larger places, but the principle is the same, whatever scale of place you live in, is that these settlements we make are dynamic living evolutionary systems. So 
our objective for the week is to give you opportunities to reflect on this relationship that we have with our communities so that you can best serve your community or your city so it in return can best serve you and so that all together we can serve the well-being of our planet Gaia. We've been talking a lot about um, nature and cities as living systems and I felt the urge today to shine a light on the fact that Marilyn and I both in our work are very actively playing with two metaphors, two nature metaphors in how we contemplate cities. For Marilyn, it's the human hive drawing on the wisdom of bees. For myself, I play with the notion of the city as a nest. It's, it's the habitat that we make for ourselves that both um, nurtures us, but also is a, is a platform from which we leap to go and do new things. This is the illustration that's hidden on the cover of my book. And given yesterday, one of the light bulbs that went off in the, in the after chat was this notion of the role of the worm and the, and the role the worm plays to nourish our soul. Our soul, that was a misstep, our soil, but we, what we were exploring was the soul of the soil. And the worms are connected to bees, the worms are connected to birds, the worms are connected to the, the, the soil on which each of our cities and communities sit. So on Monday, just to backtrack a little bit, we were looking at cities at scale from the individual all the way up to the eco region and whatever work we choose to do at whatever scale, it, it counts. On Tuesday, we were looking at cities as living systems that are complex and adaptive. They have consciousness, they have culture in addition to our behaviors and our infrastructure. Yesterday on Wednesday, we were, we were looking in an implicit way, we were looking at the different places communities find themselves in and that there is no one standard governance practice. It depends on the life conditions, both of a, of a city as a whole, and it changes from city to city, but also inside different pockets and different scales within the city. And today we're going to explore what it means to practice mutual agency. Yesterday we were exploring mutual trust. What does it mean to trust in each other? We're going to dive into that today. And tomorrow we're going to enable, we're going to bring it all together and figure out what, what is the coherence that is emerging for us as people who live in communities and cities who wish to improve them who wish to be drawn into the tension and the conflict as an evolutionary impulse rather than a means or a reason to distrust each other. One of our frames that Marilyn and I are using is um, this notion of if the world were 100 people. This comes from Danella Meadows. Marilyn and I are two white gals from Canada that live in Scotland and Canada. And we recognize that we do not represent how cities the face of cities on our planet. So just take a gander at only five of a hundred of us would even speak English. And if we were a hundred people, we would have 14 of us not able to read and write. We would have 40 who do not even have an internet connection. So all this to say that those of us on the call do not represent very well the cities and the people of our world. This is a quick snapshot of what New York City would actually look like if we looked, if we used that principle to look at a city, it's not all white people. This is typically how we think of things. So who's here? This is a list of the, the beautiful people that have joined Marilyn and I and are willing to put their their reflective practice on display for you. Um, Rick has put bios for all of these folks in the, in the chat. Um, and we're gonna take a moment to hear from the collection of these people that have joined us here today. And you'll notice that over the course of the week, there's different people popping in and sliding out. We have some new folks today, some returnees today. Um, and what I'm going to ask is all of the guests here on the panel to put your camera back on so we can see you. And I will call on you to introduce yourself. I need to do a quick adjustment to my computer here. 
Good to see your faces. And I'm going to ask you, and I'll, I'll tip you off who's going to introduce yourself, but if you would tell us your name and where you live, and for those that, you, that are returning, if you would just identify a thread that you've been carrying um, over the course of the week. And if you're one of the folks that are new on the call today, if you would tell us just a little snippet of something that excites you about your work right now. Okay, so your name, where you live, and if you're returning, a thread that's alive in you. And if you're brand new this week, just tell us a little thing of, of excitement about work that you're doing right now. And I'm gonna call on Sony first. I'm gonna go from Sony and then to Patty, please. Go ahead, Sony, unmute yourself. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to day 162. Um, my name is Sony Dasapatra. I'm from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm on Treaty 6, a traditional meeting ground, gathering place, and traveling reach the Cree, Sato, Blackfoot, Métis, Dene, and Nakota Sioux, and acknowledge the many First Nations and Inuit who footsteps that mark the Canadian lands for centuries. I start with this line acknowledgement because I myself um, was born and raised in Edmonton. My dad had come from India to Edmonton in the 60s. Um, my main uh, four principles are being a Jedi warrior, justice, equity, diversity, inclusion. This is what I carry with me always. The biggest thread that happened yesterday for me when we talked about um, our topic was the degenerational rift that is occurring because of colonization, because of this time that we're in, because of the disconnect for community. And I think what's really powerful for me is un unraveling and researching history to be rewritten in different ways, because often history is written in a very skewed Eurocentric way. So how do we incorporate other voices with agency to make it more holistic? Thank you. Thank you, Sony. Patty, and then Andres, please. Hello, everyone. Lovely to be here. Um, the work that I'm involved in is regeneration of sorts in a way of regeneration, generating the soul, regenerating our minds. And what has struck me hugely was we spoke of decolonization and how the decolonization of our minds and our structures need to happen. And we're very aware of it in the way our cities are structured here in South Africa based on the racism and the racial laws that existed. And they impact, continually weave their ways. I was very struck by the weaving word um, right throughout. And again, this today with Beth. And feeling that, that weave coming alive and going dead. I was also, Mireille Michelle spoke yesterday around, or two days ago, about the deadness of a, a building site and the aliveness that needs to happen. So there's something around, well, there's a lot. There's a lot around the work that we're doing here with what is beneath the soil. And in the African spirit, it's the ancestors the burial sites are very important and the ancestors don't only live in the soil, they live in us. They live with us, behind us and in front of us. Our work, how do we become good ancestors to those who come? Thank you, after. Patty. Thank you. Andres and then Indra, please. Hello everyone. Again, glad to be here. I'm in France. Um, and what uh, the thread that has been alive for me is um, how to continue in communication um, with people. The cities, are, it's in one hand, it's so easy to meet people because you have this proximity compared to, let's say, the, the country. But still, there's a wariness that with the current situation we have, um, the masks are, they not only prevent germs, but they also prevent conversation. And I'm uh, really interested in see how we keep the conversation going um, because cities are a place where that's a lot easier normally than um, in, in other places. 
And so that's uh, what I'm um, really observant of. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Andres. Indra and then Yane, please. Yes, hello everyone, a pleasure to be here. Uh, yes, the theme that I picked up from yesterday's uh, gathering was very much from when Vandana Shiva was talking about Swaraj and the importance of uh, self-organizing and self-determination. Uh, so um, the city, in a way, is a perfect container for people to meet each other in and find their shared agency. But how does their independence and their autonomy as a city work with the independence and autonomy of other cities. So I feel that this global uh, network of, of self-determining cities is a real challenge for us. Um, at the same time, it could be our greatest opportunity for the future. Thank you, Indra. And I forgot. <laughs> Oh, Yane is who I said next. Okay, Yane and uh, and then Julian, please. <clears throat> Thanks, Beth. You can hear me okay? Yes, perfectly. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, um, good. I'm Yane. I'm based in Lusaka, Zambia right now. That's where I'm calling from. This is my first day. And I'm going to follow what uh, Beth encouraged us to do. And I'm just going to share what, what is emerging for me. My work is on leadership development and more so about intentional living, to live with intention, to make choices with intention. And I wonder how that meshes with how we develop our cities. I go sometimes to uh, you know, Switzerland or any other European cities, and then you see so much, uh, even order in the way that it's built or in the way that things are organized. And when I come back to Africa, sometimes I see that we don't have that order, not because we can't have that order, but I think it's not within the system. And so today, as I listen to, to all of us, um, and as I uh, attend here, it comes together for me that intentional living, intentional choices and intentional leadership also links to how we build our cities, what kind of soul we choose to give our cities, and each and every citizen is responsible for that. Thank you. Thank you, Yane. Julian, and then Karen, please. Yeah, hi everybody. I'm Julian Baller today in Mexico. Um, I'm a scholar in cultural history and theory and managing director of Co-Creating Europe, a network of change agents working on a new vision of Europe that really embraces unity and diversity. And what really excites me about my work currently is discovering and tapping into the realization that European culture and spirituality cannot be understood without a deep understanding of the particular constitutions and challenges of urban communities and living spaces. And in that, I'm really getting interested in what I call uh, how, what I call vertical tensions and synergies between secular powers and belief systems and spiritual agencies are negotiated and manifested in the energetic, social and physical architecture of urban spaces. Thank you, Julian. Okay, Karen and then Taiza, please. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's so nice to be, to be here with all of you. Uh, like so my friend Sony, uh, I am also based in Treaty 6 territory. Thank you, Sony, for that uh, lovely uh, land acknowledgement. Um, I was originally from, uh, from China and uh, having uh, traveled, worked, and lived in multiple places um, in North America, I am always conscious that I am a humble guest um, and a student of land and places that come with a deep history, knowledge, experience of the first people that have come long before, you know, Edmonton 
calls itself Edmonton and the city as we know it today. Um, I, I currently work in the philanthropic sector in Canada on a project called Participatory City that perhaps has some resonance with Nest City and Integral City, uh, building on this theme of um, uh, people co-building co and co-creating uh, their neighborhoods and the places they work, live, and play. And that's what I'm excited about, is to do that at multiple scales. Um, and I look forward to the conversation today. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Okay, Thaisa and then Stanley. Thank you. I'm Thaisa Matos. I'm calling from Rio, Brazil. I'm super grateful to join you today. This is also my first day. So what inspires me about my work, I work for the Global Eco Village Network. And what inspires me is to connect and support regenerative communities all over the globe and to systematize their innovations and sustainable solutions in order to spread it over. So yeah, glad to be here with you. Thank you. Thank you, Thaisa. Stanley, and then we'll have a quick introduction from Marilyn. Thank you. This is day four for me and uh, I am uh, <coughs> loving the discussions and uh, the knowledge and learnings that is coming from interacting with all of, all of you and the other panelists and also the charts afterwards. I've joined only once. Um, I am currently involved in a project on uh, how to support regenerative work in Zimbabwe uh, via the seeds cryptocurrency for regenerative civilization. And uh, I see a huge opportunity following up on what Paddy was saying, which is the fact that for most of us Africans, we are still very, very connected to the spirit of the land. Uh, but that separation is, is starting and continuing. And so if we are not careful, we are going to lose that connection. And I think the discussions we are having here, I would like to bring those discussions to the people who are working with regenerative work in, in Zimbabwe and in other African countries so that this could become the new way of developing. This could be the new way of living as we build our villages and as we build our cities. So that's what is uh, in my mind as we start this conversation today. Thank you. Thank you, Stanley. Marilyn, would you let us know who you are much the same way our others have? And then I'll, I'll set us up for you to come back and do the reflection. Thanks, Beth, and thanks everyone. I'm Marilyn Hamilton. I'm located in Fintorn Eco Village in Scotland. As Beth mentioned, I'm a Canadian, but I've immigrated back to my land of the ancestors. Uh, my work is about looking at the city as a living, evolutionary, holistic system. As uh, Jim mentioned at the beginning, science shows us that cities are the organism um, that outlives both nations and organizations. So it's really very interesting to me to understand that uh, Gaia has evolved us for a purpose. James Lovelock says that we are Gaia's reflective organs, and that's what excites me about doing the work to make not only um, that possible for us to wake up to, but I think we're at a stage in 2021 where we have to grow into that. So Beth, delighted to be with you and uh, start day four with all these wonderful people. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marilyn. All right, a quick share of the screen again. And what, um, what I want to invite our guests, both that we see on the screen and everyone watching live or watching down the road is to imagine that the work that you do, and when I say work, I mean paid or unpaid, like it's just, it's the stuff that you do that you contribute to the world. And it does indeed shape the world around us. That's the, that's the premise I operate with. And I want to also offer that it's a sacred exchange. And I was hinting at this earlier, the, the if I shovel the sidewalk for my neighbor, I'm that's work. That's something I contribute to, to my neighborhood. The work that I do to mediate conflict in my city is a contribution to my city. My dentist makes 
a contribution. I've had a lot of dental issues. That's why I keep, I keep coming back to that. But whether we're a teacher, whether we're an activist, whether we work like really locally on the ground or we're doing a spiritual service, it is all a contribution. And it is a contribution, not if we're doing it from a sense of duty and obligation, but we're making that contribution because we see an experience tension in our community and we can see that there's something to improve. And we can feel deep within that that improvement is a pull on me and that pull on me is a pull on all of us and that's the evolutionary impulse. And the connection I'm making to things earlier this week is that we, we have to exercise some mutual trust that the work that I don't do is work that others is going to pick, are going to pick up. And just to connect a little bit more to where our work at the center of this diagram situates with the physical habitat of the world that we, um, there's the natural world we've been given and we have inherited. And then there's also the physical world that we make. And it's only as good as we make it. It's as crappy as we make it. It's as great as we make it. So if it doesn't serve us well because we design to keep people separately or we design to be you know, ecologically disastrous, it's our work that reshapes that and reshapes our city. In this diagram, I've put what I call a social habitat in the center. And to me, it functions kind of like a, like a valve. If it's shut off, then the work that we do, both from myself as an individual or us as groups read up to the scale of the species, if, this, if, if we're not in tune with ourselves, our work is not in tune with the ecological world or it's not in tune with, with each other. So I wanna offer that up as a frame for us today. And I'm going to stop sharing with that. And Marilyn, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass the torch over to you. And given what I've just offered, um, I want to quickly note for the audience that's familiar with the pattern that Indra is serving as our focus reflector today. And the others on the call are serving as our, our model reflective practitioners. And Marilyn will lead us through, um, all of us, so audience, you too, through a reflective practice. And we will hear from all voices and then Indra will reflect on, on those voices. And much the same way as we experience our communities, we make slivers of contributions, but it's what they add up to that's significant. So Marilyn, with that, would you walk us through the reflection? Thanks, Beth. Yes, it's really wonderful that the term reflective practitioner resonates with what I just referenced, that Gaia has evolved us apparently to be her reflective organs. So. I invite all us reflective organs, the cells in those organs that our individuals are, just to get comfortable where you're seated and uh, just settle yourself into your body. If you're comfortable, close your eyes or soften your gaze. Take a deep breath and settle yourself into the space immediately around you. Notice how you are aware of yourself from the smallest part of you to the most expanded, that part that you can feel when you take a deep breath and your heart opens. Notice how you are aware of others who may be nearby or on this internet call, literally a world away, and feel the sensation of the field that we co-create together. In this space, which may be quiet, 
or may have sounds. Just notice the relationships that matter to you. Reconnect with that heart space that we felt at the beginning when Jim led us through the heart coherence. And notice how you feel when your heart is expanded. And remember a place at a time in your city where you felt mutually connected with others. I'm just going to pause a minute so we can do this in silence. You can sense who was there. What was the place like? What qualities enabled connection? And take another deep breath. And when you're feeling called, just open your eyes. Look around you in your real space. And on the magical non-local space time that is a Zoom screen. And see in front of you the world that you are connected with right now, right here. Thank you. Now I want to call on our reflective practitioners to just share with us what came up for you in that reflection. And you notice how you felt really attracted to some particular experience in the city. How was trust actually an aspect of that experience? And as Beth was speaking, how do you trust others to be doing something that's different than what you do? And I'm going to call now on the people who are with us for the first time today so that we give them the opportunity to share what they've noticed to start with. And I'll start with Julian and then go to Thaisa. Well, in the place, places of connection that came came really up for me were the places that the that the club scene in Berlin provides, which Berlin is very famous for, which are in the best cases very very safe for the LGBTQ plus community, but also really suspending usual patterns of exclusion of shame and judgment. And there is, there is a connection for me taking, happening in these places and unity experiences are made because you can express yourself kind of shamelessly on the dance floor. You can express yourself sexually. You can experiment with substances that are usually illegalized and so many of the current rules and values are suspended, but at the same time, the golden rule is consent and inclusivity. And those spaces are, I think, very kind of very empowering, empowering mutual agency. And Berlin in that sense has also become now a global reference point for these. And there are, Marilyn once talked about the islands of calm and I was very inspired by that. And those are maybe islands of noise and rhythm that all that have that hold kind of similar potential and quality. Thank you, Julian. Thanks for bringing in the islands of calm and contrasting it with the islands of noise and diversity. Thank you. 
Thaisa, and then Yane. I was inspired by your guidance and I traveled back to an event in, in, in Rio when we were together with the neighborhood co-creating our future steps. So we invited all initiatives and the community around. It is in a neighborhood called Santa Teresa in the central area of Rio and like more than 200 people joined us. And each one, it was in a, in a public space in a big park and we got permission to gather there and each one was sharing their work and um, knowledge and we were dancing together and like it was so amazing to see the potential of our neighborhood so i think it's interesting to see how much diversity we can have in a city and how much we can like get stronger if we decided to do it together That's my insights for now. Beautiful, Thaisa. Yes, it's wonderful how we can actually dare to call differences together that can make a difference. That's a beautiful story. Thank you. Thank you. Yane. And then we'll hear from um, Karen. Thank you, Marilyn. I, I was also very inspired by your guidance. And it made me both very happy and also very sad. So the good memory is a memory of, I am such, it's incredible. I get teary all the time, sorry. The good memory is a memory Not of, um, <clears throat> in Ethiopia growing up, and in the rainy season to go to, down the street to the pastry shop in an old beetle car. And there's a sense of safety and community in the whole neighborhood. It's not small, it's, it's like a little, um, it, it's a good 30 square kilometers area I'm talking about. And there's the, that sense of safety and community. Even if you didn't know the people, you knew that somehow you're related, we coexisted together. So we coexisted together across genders, across religion, across ethnicities, and it just felt safe. Even the scent in the pastry shop is different. And it's, it's nothing luxurious. It was a very modest pastry shop and you buy your cakes and you go back in a very modest old beetle to drive back home and share it with everybody. And I think of that, and I relate it also to what you said about that cities have souls and personalities. And then what makes me sad is in the recent years in Africa, in the name of development and modernity, we're chopping down trees that are 300, 400 years old. We're dismantling small avenues to make six lane uh, highways, which we don't need. Um, in the name of being developed. And, and we, we build high rises that sometimes nobody occupies or we're not able to finish. And the city is disfigured. It's, you don't recognize it. And so that sense of going home, feeling safe and connected is vanishing by the day. And I think I've, I've, I know most African cities I think this stands for most of them. Um, and I wonder, where are we going? Where are we going? When is it enough? What, what kind of consciousness are we building, planning these cities with? Or is it about um, contracts that you give to developers? So I'm torn between really beautiful memories and also a sense of desolation when I think of what else is gonna come in the future? Where is the soul going? How is it gonna live or is it already gone? Thank you. 
Thank you, Yenny. Those are very powerful questions. We touched on a few of them yesterday. One of the big things that came out of our discussion was the connection of city to nature, city to its ecoregions, and that um, we are not in the city or on the city. We are the city, and at the same time, we're nature. So they're wonderful, deep, soulful questions you're asking. Thank you. Karen, what about you? And then I will call on Patty. Um, thank you so much, uh, everyone, for sharing. Um, I think in the moment of stillness and silence, Marilyn, you you guided us through. I was, I was actually thinking about voice uh, and related to the question of agency, um, because I think agency is about giving voice uh, to each other. Uh, and when you said, you know, who who uh, think of a time when you felt really mutually connected to others, and it related. I immediately thought of a, a particular event, um, like Taisa as well, where I, I, I supported, I helped out on an event um, that was a, meant to be a space that brought to different people, um, brought communities of, of color in Edmonton, those who are, um, you know, indigenous, so racialized of immigrant background in our city together for, for a dialogue. And it included music and art, but above all, a conversation. Um, and, you know, from, we heard people say that, uh, you know, we had people who are, who are black of uh, African and Caribbean descent saying that this is the first time I've heard the story of an indigenous person and vice versa. Uh, and I was the the MC, and I actually spoke very little. My role was to to give instructions and keep time and just and 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 just listen. And all I heard was chatter in the room. And I've actually never felt so connected in a space than that in that moment, um, because I thought it was just you know it's important to give space for others to share their stories, uh, especially when we are of such different age, gender, you know, color, and uh, but bringing all of that story, and we were all. Um, Edmontonians, we were all, you know, of this, um, of the city. So that was what I related to. Mm, beautiful. Thank you. And voice is really so important. And when we were looking at how to do this event, we were thinking of how do we bring the diversity of voices and faces to the experience here. And we're all so much longing to something that you're um, sharing about gathering in places where we can be with one another and there can be that personal touch. So the voicing of it as well. I also know in Fintorn here, we long with our musicians, especially to sing together, to have our community choirs. And just as you say, to be in conversation with one another. So simple, but so important. Thank you. Patty, and then Andres. Patty, you're on mute. Thank you. Patty, thank you. yeah, thank you. Um, the singing together brought back what I was thinking about as um, we were in the reflection. And Andreas, you spoke a little bit about, you know, how are we going to speak again? So I'm thinking of the voice, I'm thinking of the song, I'm thinking, thinking of this muffling that we have behind our masks where we're, we're actually moving inwards. And I don't think the inwards is a bad thing. I think it's a good thing. I remember on the first day that lockdown happened, um, total lockdown here. I live in the suburbs. It's very garden, very tree filled and very close to the mountain. But it was unbelievable to, to wake up and walk out. I don't think the birds were singing. There wasn't a sound of the car. There was no sound of anybody in the neighbor. It was silent. It was so silent. And I wasn't used to the silence in the city that it disturbed me somewhat. It, it, was, it opened something in my heart that was longing for this deep silence that you find in the spaces in nature away from the hustle and the bustle. And slowly, slowly, the next day, a little bit more sound emerged, a dog or two barked. Um, the third day, there was a bit of a normality. You heard, pe you heard people in the, the different gardens. And so we had to establish ourselves in a very different way. The breath of the city, the life of the city changed. I could hear a change. We could all hear a change. 
And we suddenly were within, within the walls of our parameters, keeping very quietly in, wondering how this was, um, again, I'm going to talk about the, the times in, in our cities when there was enforced um, curfews that um, our black people were not allowed to go out after a certain time where the whites were able to. I mean, you know, as I talk about this, I can't believe actually that was my childhood. But as we came into the shifting of us getting used to the new way and we were allowed to go out, we were allowed to go out for an hour's exercise, everybody for the first time in the neighborhood spilled onto the streets and the streets became a lot. There were no cars again, bicycles, um, people walking, children, families. I've never seen families together in the way that we saw families together again. And it's been very interesting as the different levels of lockdown have happened, how the city has adjusted in its way of communing with each other and the way of freeing its spirit in some ways. There's some things I really don't want to go back to. And there's some things I miss deeply. And it's that, that, that molding of what is going to be created. Can we, can we take that on consciously and intentionally? And um, can we go to the local bread store and, and feel, smell the bread again? And um, can we have the families walking in the streets? And how do we work with what is so-called development? Do we reframe that? So, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Paddy. Andres, and then Sony, and now our last three people I'm going to ask to be as concise as possible so we leave as much time as possible for Indra to share. Andres, what came up for you? Well, I, I, I was um, inspired by what Julian said, um, that space in the, in the club. And um, I remember, when I resonated the most with people I didn't know was at a party, but it was a masked party. And what, what, what was, I mean, I commented on this with a couple of friends that I knew and I didn't know most of the people was it, how easy it is to everybody interact with each other and say, yes, because we don't know each other, we're hidden from each other. And uh, mm -hmm. so the, 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 the disguise that we had allowed us to interact much more spontaneously. And and then I, I um, another event that was much more public. That was a pri that was a party. But uh, every every uh, summer solstice, June twenty first, they have a music festival here, and that's probably the only day when diversity is all you're looking for. And so everybody who has any sort of musical instrument or any sort of dis di outfit is 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 invited uh, to to play in the public venue to play on the street they block streets and um, people that, that normally don't interact are interacting and and once again this is music which is I've seen as a thread coming through here uh, and mm -hmm. I I I wonder um, and it's public music and I, I look at I have these here and I, sometimes I I, leave, I see these as weapons of mass distraction in terms of interacting with other people. Because when I go on the tramway and I put these on, um, I'm gone. They're, they're, you know, I'm, the tramway is full of people, but I'm not talking to anybody. And I, what, I, what, I, what I've discovered is that, I, I, as I'm saying, with, with, with the lockdown, um, do we have to actually make an extra effort uh, in our habits uh, to just w interact with people? Um, and for me, that, that can simply mean not wearing my headphones when I'm on the tram. Mm. Uh, and because I don't have a choice of not wearing the mask, um, but I, I do have a and then, and you can hear people. And that just, just listening to people for me connects as well. So I wanted to share that, thank you. Beautiful, thank you, Andres. Sonny and then Stanley. Um, so the Gaia for me is Shakti because I'm Hindu and Shakti is divine feminine energy. Um, like I said, my dad is from India. So our community here every year will host a big Durga Puja like they do in Calcutta with like all the spiritual pomp, but it's held in a community hall. 
So you come to this community hall, it's very basic, very Western for recreation, for everyday life. But it get, over seven days, it gets transformed with all this spiritual energy, all this smell of like India, all this like rise of the feminine and the goddess in all her glory. Um, and that's a spiritual connection to the city of Edmonton. Similarly, when I go to indigenous ceremony, if I go to a sweat, if I go to a feast, just that kind of energy that's created by all of us coming together to really pray and to have that kind of spiritual high, it's similar, right? So these spaces, but are very sacred and private and with certain people, right? And not everybody sometimes is invited to that space. So it's a protected space that's building spiritual space for the city. Yet when I come out into the city city to interact with many different people, that's when that spiritual space will get destroyed, right? Because as a young brown woman, I go to a yoga studio. I see all these white skinny bodies performing yoga, um, mm -hmm. worshiping Shakti, mm -hmm. not able to understand what they're doing or why they're doing it often, not everybody, but often. So a total appropriation of Shakti and my culture and my spirit. Or I go to a music festival. Somebody's wearing a headdress, indigenous headdress, um, sporting um, different indigenous symbolism. That is also appropriation. So this split in spirit really hurts my soul and my heart often. Because it's like, you know, if you appreciate it truly and you are, are using it for a spiritual goodness to restore the dead spirit that is in the ground, that is in nature, that is in the ether, it's such a beautiful thing. But when you do it in ignorance and without understanding and without that kind of genuinity, it really destroys the practice. So that comes back to yesterday, Vandana Shiva said a beautiful thing, metabolic drift, metabolic drift, right? I feel that often in my city. Thank you. Mm. Thank you, Sunny. Stanley, and then I'll turn it to Beth. Thank you. Uh, Sony just took me back to India, so I will go with that experience. <laughs> I, sp I had the opportunity to spend six months in Kerala in the villages, beautiful villages of Kerala. And uh, what I remember from that time, uh, which was uh, an amazing experience for me, it was almost like a six months meditation because when I was in Kerala, people had no pre-assumptions about who I was. They were just curious about who I was. And because of that curiosity, they came to me, they talked to me. I remember one time I was walking on the beach, I had my head shaven and uh, these small boys came and wanted to kiss my head because they thought I was some kind of shaman, you know, <laughs> African shaman walking on the beach in India. And, and so that was my whole experience. It's just like people being curious about who is this man, you know? And I was getting invited to dinners. People wanted to take me to the villages to show me things. And I thought, this is the kind of life I would like to live. You know? And uh, so that's, that's the experience that comes up for me, <laughs> being in the center Thank of attention. You, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Stanley. I'd just like to call on Beth now to introduce Indra. Thank you, Marilyn. And thank you, all of you reflective practitioners showing for us such a range of experience of your communities. Because this happens at the scale of the planet, it happens for sure at the scale of our communities too. So Indra plays a slightly different role for us today and that is to serve as a reflector reflector of the reflections that were just offered. And Indra is a co-initiator co of the Alternative UK, a political platform that's part of a global network. And she, um, she also is a writer. So she has a couple of books that you can, you can check out. She's quite clever. And she also has consulted to the World Economic Forum the Indian, Finnish, and Danish governments, NATO, 
the Scottish Executive and the Institute of Contemporary Arts amongst others. I invite you to check Indra out at her website at indraadnan.com. And one of her books is The Politics of Waking Up, Power and Possibility in the Fractal Age. And that one actually is coming out in May of this year. So Indra, lovely to have you. You served as a reflector yesterday. You have a different role today. Um, please, please take um, eight to 10 minutes to offer your reflection on what you've just been witnessing. Thank you so much, Beth. And uh, it's quite a strange experience to hear you suddenly referencing the world that I come from and the world that I operate in. It's almost like I had to suddenly step out of a very warm bath um, that I had just immersed myself in um, of um, a hugely diverse um, set of reflections, it seems to me, to the proposition that Marilyn put at the beginning of what it does it mean in a way for us to come together. And what I heard was, um, in some cases, uh, descriptions of safe spaces where people who share um, a spiritual readiness to come together enjoying togetherness. I mean, in, in a sense, what I heard from Julian about the club scene in Berlin, I'm very familiar with. Um, I have many of these, uh, what I call micro solidarities in my life, where people of like minds, uh, very happy really to be open to each other, can come together and share their hopes and dreams, but also their deep authentic selves. But at other levels, the need for safety in order to come together was more of a prere prerequisite. So not necessarily an assumption or an ease with each other at a deep level, but some sort of a need for a container, some maybe rules need to be set that allow people to move into a relationship of trust with each other. Uh, and then still others um, who maybe will come together under a question or a challenge. I heard, I really heard deeply what Sony was describing about a new awareness or a new waking upness to the deep injustice of our gathering spaces. You know, how many of the people that we meet easily will truly deeply understand the terms on which we are gathering. And sometimes that awareness has to be the prerequisite of our gathering. So just to take these different requirements or these different ideas of what coming together might mean into a city, um, it's a huge challenge, it seems to me. Um, at the, right at the beginning of our discussion, we talked very freely amongst ourselves about the need and the importance of seeing ourselves as nature and seeing ourselves as city. I think, Marilyn, you referred to this a number of times. But there are so many people living in cities who never have had the opportunity at all to think about or to be in nature. Nature to them, some of the people, is actually something that exists outside of their daily lives. Sometimes maybe even a thing they might visit on a holiday. Um, and increasingly, in terms of the sort of news narratives, the division is growing between people who think about the environmental needs that we are now feeling ourselves to be very, very urgent are becoming politicized and divided. So when we started the Alternative UK, we were really looking at this division, the social division that our news media has fomented, but that reflects absolutely the political divisions that have been caused by our party political system. So when we think about a party political system, we think about 
tribes of people who are working within a power system that requires us to be in opposition to each other. And this culture of opposition has been reflected in our cities. So within cities, if you move through the streets, you will find pockets of people who look at each other as not only as the other, but sometimes as the enemy. How do we bring together cities that have been pre-divided by a political system that is our very source of power? We're living in a very complex dynamic of where our agency lies. And nowhere more so than in a city where neighborhoods can share some sense of belonging. And sometimes even within a neighborhood, even within a street, people have been divided against each other. So the city becomes a crucible, if you like, for, uh, for division and for um, separation and disconnection as much as it becomes the opportunity for people coming together across a great diversity. So with this in mind, when we first started the, the Alternative UK and the question was that we put to ourselves, if politics is broken, in other words, if the system of power is broken, what's the alternative? And until then, as Beth was, was, was describing to you, I'd been thinking very much on global and international terms. And partly that's because I'm a global citizen myself and have no real belonging in a nation. My father's from Indonesia, my mother's from Holland. We traveled, I ended up in London, which is a very diverse space, but the national identity doesn't really exist for me. I have a more free floating identity. And in fact, I became a Buddhist and that became my identity. So it became very obvious to us uh, over the period, perhaps over the whole of the, you know, the, the, the first 10 years of the 21st century, that um, whatever the people seeking a good and healthy planet or the people seeking the good life or the people seeking to be more together, whatever we might come up with as a solution or a set of solutions. The reality is we can be sabotaged by other people who have been manipulated or motivated to be constantly in opposition to whatever it is that we decide to do. So therefore we need a new political system or a new way of being political that reflects the need for our cities to move into relationship. So how could we do that? And this is when we came up with the concept of a citizens action network. Um, and the goal uh, of bringing people together across a city in the space they live to move into conversation with each other. And once they were doing that, instead of looking at the problems they need to solve, really to look at the future they may want to move towards together. So this concept of a citizens action network uh, comes into being through working in the city, working very assiduously across the different micro solidarities that exist, inviting them into a space that is ultimately a friendly space. And I noticed that many people in the room talked about the need for dance, the need for voice, the need for energy, the need for love, the need for a good feeling in that space. We prioritize that when we bring people together. And then slowly, through very careful facilitation, we move people into discussion about a future that they would like to see together. And then once we've discussed the kind of future we might be able to co-create, we talk about how that can be organized. So these are islands, if you like, or containers 
for human beings to move into relationship with each other across divides, but using their very human resources of imagination, creativity, uh, the ability to have rapport with each other, the ability to make relationship with each other. These are human centered units that we then think of as the new units for a new politics. Indra, I, I, love, I love where you've landed for me is with yeah. the words islands of relationship. And what I'm, I'm, I'm recognizing the islands of calm, the, the islands of noise that Julian articulated. And then now with you, this notion of islands of relationship. And I'm reflecting that all of the others that have gathered with us in the call, their work, every single one of them is about making islands of, of relationship. So what I'd like to do is, is pause you now at this point, Indra, and quite quickly hear from our practitioners here to give you a moment to notice what your islands of relationship are and let us know what they are. Because I think they'll serve as really good examples for, for the audience listening in later, but also for the audience listening in now. Notice where your islands of relationship are drop them in the chat you might get some ideas and recognize these from our from our practitioners um, but very quickly i'm going to call on you if you feel like you need to pass i can come back to you um, but i'd like to check in with folks and see how what indra spoke to resonates with you in your practice and i'm looking to hear from you for about 30 seconds okay um, Sony, I'm going to start with you, and then I'll, I'll go to Yene. And if you need to pass, I'll come back, because I know I'm moving quickly here. Sony? I think I love what you said, everybody. And thank you, Indra, for um, encapsulating that so beautifully. Um, I, I really feel like awareness and belonging is what we strive for. So I appreciate that that's been articulated. And another thing is also like, recognition. So how I started this introduction was historically whose stories are told, whose narratives are heard, and who is silenced, as Karen has said, right? So it needs to, everybody's voice needs to be heard. So if there is a 5,000 year yoga practice that comes from an indigenous tradition <laughs> that is based in South Asia, I'm requesting that you respect that tradition and not the watered down whitewashed version that has come to the West post colonization. So to me, it's like that having that understanding of that history of the depth and breadth of it, if you're gonna engage in that and understanding the spirituality that comes with that and not just saying that, oh, well, I'm new in this. I was reading the chat. I just feel like there needs to be a recognition that different people's voices have been silenced for more than 500 years and that rising needs to happen for awareness, belonging, inclusion and diversity. Thank you. Thank you, Sony. Yane, and then Stanley, yeah. please. Yes, thank you. You know, when you talk about relationship, I often tell people that I work with, and especially now in the leadership program that I do for young women, that it's not about having a stack of business cards or, you know, a gazillion connections on Facebook and LinkedIn, but it's about having an authentic relationship. Even if you meet somebody for five minutes in the elevator, that we're able to have an authentic conversation, a real conversation. Even if you say, good morning, mean it. Don't say it if you don't mean it. It's okay to be quiet. So this relationship, this me knowing you and you knowing me expanded in millions of people is what's gonna create the kind of community that we need where we're automatically going to care for one another and we're going to care about one another's space. So if I care for you, I'm not gonna come on your street, chop down the trees, right? Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Yane. Stanley and then Karen, please. So your, your question, what are our islands of relationships? And uh, for me, I have, uh, because I've been moving a lot, I tend to create them. So I've had cooking clubs, I've had dinners, Jefferson and dinners where we bring people together who don't know each other, have a discussion, get a new relationship going. 
And uh, I have had spaces where I facilitated dialogues, facilitated dialogues about the future. And then, of course, I have my normal islands of relationship, my village where I come from, my family where who travels with me all the time, and the people that I'm working with on the different projects that I work with. Thank you. Karen, I know this is what you do. Go ahead, Karen. Um, oh, and Karen, and then after Karen, I'll call on Andres. Um, well, I just uh, very much resonating with everybody. And um, and I think coming back to, you know, what Sonia brought up about stories, I think islands are about shared stories. And sometimes not, maybe it's not shared. Maybe it's about that mutual respect to listen to each other's stories. And uh, when we don't always have that mutual respect to, to listen, because as you know, she said that there are so many that are silenced. I think it's hard to form those islands. Um, I, I work on on a project that has a you know that spans multiple cities across the ocean, um, and these I, my islands are formed not through physical uh, distance, but really, uh, I think through some of those shared values, the shared stories. Um, um, and uh, an ability to kind of to hear each other out. And I have my own, just uh, in terms of my everyday work, uh, those islands uh, that is virtual. There are people I've actually never met in my life, but, but I feel safe enough um, to connect and to lean on. So that's what I'll say about that. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Andres and then Julian, please. Um, in, my, in my day job, um, I explain to people who are already in relationship um, why they are having um, trouble understanding the other. So basically oranges and apples and bananas and that sort of thing. Um, but what I, the, the challenge that comes up for me now is I realize, um, well, what can you do in your daily life uh, to uh, move into a relationship with each other with across, across divides? Um, I mean, I can I can join one of your one of your meetings, Indra, uh, which I'd love to. But uh, once again, I go back to this idea of of re, um, reducing reducing the distractions that I have, and uh, and it, what I've noticed is that I have to get out of my comfort zone to actually um, just listen to people that I don't normally interact with, but I'm that are better out there on the city street uh, in my neighborhood, and. Um, once a little while ago, I was walking back from the tram and, and there was a couple of people standing on the street and I said, hello, and, and we made eye contact and we continued talking. And I thought that's what that's, it, that doesn't take much effort, but that makes all the difference. And I remember how feel, how connected I felt after that. And I still remember the man's name. And every time I go by that little corner, I look around and I see whatever he's around. He's around. So that's where... I have to say, thank you. Thanks, Andres. Julian, and then Taiza, and then I'll call on Patty. Yeah, living living in such a metropolis as Berlin, I really, the, the islands of connection I usually go to myself is the cultural institutions, clubs, museums, theaters, and I feel there is a great challenge in decolonizing and diversifying them so they can really be islands of relationship for everyone where more stories are heard. And at the same time, I felt very inspired by what Yene was sharing about. It's also like the five minutes in the elevator is what we have to do in our day-to-day -day life, especially now that some islands of connection that are usually frequented are closed. So I'm kind of feeling very inspired to carry a small inflatable island of connection around with me that I can set up where, wherever I go and have the chance to. Thanks, Julian. Taiza and then Patty. Thank you. So Echo Villages are my island of relationships. They are places where you, we can live and work together. And also we can restore ecosystems together and co-create local economic systems and um, respect diversity and build community. So there's a lot of relationships going on there. I've been connected to the Eco Village movement since 2004, and I feel 
really this network of communities globally supporting our me and our work. So that's me for now. Thank you, Taiza. Patty, and then Andrew, I'm gonna to come to you for a, a last reflection, much like the others are offering, okay? So Patty and then Indra. Okay. The, the work of building communities goes on in our ongoing work. I have, have a school of working with training integral practitioners as coaches and as leaders. And in the process of working with that, um, the shape of or well, the decolonization of some of the concepts into the um, relationship with um, not necessarily my African roots. I speak through my colleagues, I speak and listen. Um, I experience um, my own uh, circles of relationship. And some of our uh, circles are uh, practice communities have gone on for over 15 years where um, we have been working with what do we do and how do we do this and these are my islands of sanity actually not only relationship but they're islands of sanity I think Margaret Wheatley speaks about and they're varied again I'm going to speak to the lockdown and the the shift it was a massive shift in in the vibration of the city and in relationship because the relationships were very wide. I traveled a lot to meet people and then we were in. And then the relationships went back to family and to small circles and small bubbles. And this vision in and out has shifted things which I'm still trying to process, but I think there is a lot that needs to be spoken about in terms of how we work with those islands and how can we create them, keep them going both over the net and the web of life and listen from the spider in my garden <laughs> making her own web. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Patty. Indra, any last reflections from you? Yes, I mean, I, I um, interestingly, the islands of relationships um, are so valuable and moving beyond the islands of relationships is even more valuable and that's I think where I am standing and I, I love um, Andreas's repeated call to be open and to you know, literally to open your ears and to be there for something you haven't expected um, when I think about my own COVID uh, experience of everything quieting down and calming down i can't ignore the majority for whom it became chaos and oppression and more scarcity and panic so knowing always that outside of our islands of relationship is something very different and the importance of relating relating myself to that is the thing that I feel very strongly in this space um, over centuries, but also into the future. Uh, thank you for that. More. Yeah. Yeah, for thank others. you. Yeah. Um, as I'm listening to you, I'm, I'm noticing how I've been playing with the nest as a metaphor, and I'm connecting that to islands of relationship. Sometimes nests are places where we go to nurture ourselves and feel very comfortable. Mm. But nests are also places where sometimes young are shoved out unexpectedly, and that sense of panic is for sure there. Or sometimes as a, a nest is we get, we leap out, and we, we explore the world and then we come back to that place of comfort. Sometimes we, we need to build brand new nests with new people to build new places where we can connect and, and refresh and regenerate those relationships and build new ways to connect with each other, which does invite Andreas's call for us to be open to being uncomfortable with other people. Marilyn? And Beth, that I'll pick up. I'll pick up on that uh, note of discomfort because we had that as a theme from yesterday. That uh, we know that um, 
we go back to nature and we look at uh, what happens when a clam um, or an oyster gets an irritant in it. It actually is able to create a pearl. That's something that we value. But, you know, there is also an equal metaphor in the human systems that when we experience dissonance, that is when we learn. And this is what I notice in our discussion today is that we're weaving through a starting um, theme of practicing mutual agency. And in practicing that, we have listened to each other's stories. And as only as a whole, when we bring them all together, we can even notice there's probably an evolutionary process through them all. We've gone from safety to belonging to expression. We spent a lot of time on the needs for that personal expression. We've noted order is needed and it emerges sometimes amidst the chaos. So we've also experienced that during the week that order actually comes out of chaos. And we've also noticed that there is something that we aim for with our intentions, that we actually have set goals and that we are drawn forward by those intentions. And with those intentions, we also in this group have all talked about the value of acceptance and accepting others who are different than us, noticing the differences that are not only what keep us apart, but which make us curious. That's the opportunity of uh, having something like the uh, citizen action groups that I love that Indra has created. I came earlier today from another CAG here at Fintorn. We call it the COVID action group. But that's what we're doing. We looked around at the eight of us and we said, you know, we have some kind of a power of eight here. We're acting as the citizen action group for this little area about this topic. But the opportunity that we have here that we've explored today through the stories, I think, um, builds on how each of the stories is able to give us a reflection, I think, about human capacity that is ever moving forward. Each of us is in different life conditions, and I really appreciate the vulnerability that you've shared in your stories that they've moved us emotionally in telling them. And I know from the chat, they've been moved by hearing them. And so agency that comes from not only noticing what is important and what we value, but what is it in our agency that moves us to action? I think that's the question that I'd like to leave us with uh, today at the end of our session. And uh, I'd like to thank you all so very much and Indra, who are taking on this beautiful role of being our focus reflective practitioner. Thank you. And I'd like to call Jim back in. Thank you, Marilyn. Uh, and thank you all. What a vigorous <laughs> and uh, dimensionalized uh, dialogue we've had today. And I must say, uh, uh, Marilyn and Beth and all of you who've been here since Monday, you know, there's a real virtue in doing multiple days so that over time, you can deepen the dialogue and deepen the, I would say, the, the, the ecology of relationships between the, the speakers. And here we are on our fourth day, and you can feel the, the depth um, of the uh, conversation uh, that has been building uh, since Monday. So I just want to acknowledge that and, and thank you for it. And I would make a closing comment about this issue of tension and struggle and strife and the irritant in the oyster, you know, reminds me of the great lines from Sophocles uh, that to act is to suffer. And if you think about it, every time we do anything, even if it's in the flow, we're changing energy, we're creating dynamic strife, as Heracles, the great Greek philosopher would have put it, all the universe is, is moved through strife in the widest sense of that term. And the comment that I would like to make is that it underscores the importance in cities and in governance generally of democracy. You know, how do human beings deal with strife? How do we deal with conflict? You know, if you remember um, 
Paul Schmuckler's uh, book um, uh, many, many uh, years ago um, called The Tribe. He puts forth the, the question through a metaphor that their tribes are uh, around a watering hole and everybody's getting along. And then a tribe of marauding warriors comes over the hill to steal the water. What do you do? And it's the real question of how we settle disputes. And if you're in a city like Sao Paulo of 20, 25 million or Mexico City, or we saw through this, the, 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 the brief history of Jericho, the history of cities is also the history of war. It's the history of democracy. And so one of the things that we're struggling with in the United States, which is one of the reasons why it's come up, is that the last four years under Donald Trump have been unbelievably stressful and violent. And the struggle between the forces that have culminated just yesterday uh, in uh, the second impeachment of uh, the president uh, is been a test of our capacity to adjudicate struggle without institutional violence. And I think that's really important for us to, to hold as we, as we think about these matters of how cities move into the future uh, with all the chaos, challenges, and um, uncertainties that uh, uh, lay before us is, is not only that we, we have to understand that strife is an inevitability, but also continue to build those sinews, that those interstices that enable us to transform the strife into transformation. Because I think that's, Marilyn, what you were just talking about. How do you take that and, and, and bring it into a transformational uh, process? And again, the fulcrum for that um, uh, are the cities uh, worldwide. Um, and um, I just say parenthetically, uh, everyone, that next week, starting on Monday, we're going to shift from a, um, a, a week on cities uh, to a week of reflecting again on democracy. How do we govern ourselves as we move into the 21st century to ensure that transformation rather than dichotomy and contradiction ensues when differences come together uh, around issues of great importance to the future of humankind. Uh, the inauguration of Joe Biden, as you know, uh, is gonna happen next Wednesday. Uh, and if you've been following the news, they're building an entire fence around the Capitol for the first time in US history. Such is the level of strife in that city, given what's happened over the last uh, seven, eight days. Um, so we see a metaphor of the challenges that are, are taking place. And we're gonna be contemplating um, matters pertaining to governance and democracy uh, over the, this next week, uh, starting um, uh, next Monday. So I want to thank you all. This has been splendid. And uh, we'll see you again uh, tomorrow on Humanity Rising, same time, same station, uh, five o'clock uh, Central European time uh, uh, on Zoom. So thank you, everyone. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Thanks, Jim. Great session. Thanks, everyone. Great session. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Bye, Yane. Bye, Indra and Thaisa. <laughs> Thank you, Patty, Karen. <laughs>